I think a lot of people, they get really, really confused. They don't understand how ratings work at all, especially today. You know, when I, I hear people and they say, you know, I'm 1900. And what they mean is they're, you know, 1900 at bullet chess on, uh, on, on Lee Chess or chess.com. Uh, and they think that equates with something else. No, th that is just, you know, it could be 1900, it could be 19 million. Uh, it could be it could be 19. It could be something else. It's a measure of performance on, you know, in that particular pool. And these things are not um, directly um, transferable else, elsewhere. And I could be wrong about this, but my understanding in bridge is that you keep accumulating points and then you become a master in bridge. But in chess, you can lose rating points. It's not, you don't always gain. You can lose points too. So I think that may come as a shock to people. And I think just the whole um, numerical system, like in chess, when we say, oh, someone's a 2200 player, we know what that means as chess players. But I think for someone new to chess, they'd be like, what does that mean? What's a 2200 player? So just getting used to the whole system is probably confusing to a lot of people. So it's not a linear map, but I think they do tend to be positively correlated, right? Your rating goes up in one category. It should kind of go up in all categories across the board. When it comes to mapping, like the puzzle readings on chess.com or Lee Chess to Blitz ratings, I really think that the correlation is not very strong there because there's so many different variables at play. How much time you spend on a puzzle, um, do you, use, you know, just play on your phone looking at the puzzle? Do you actually focus? So I find that those two don't map as well. Like here in America, I remember when I was living in Miami, uh, some people even asked me about, like, if a national master um, is more than a FIDE master, for example. They thought, actually, that national master is a higher title. So that's mostly the... the um, I would say the most weird thing about a title that I have ever heard. Rating systems are based on the number of games played and how well you did in this K factor, which is uncertainty. Now, some players have a huge K factor because they vary a lot. They can play very well or very poorly. And speed chess accentuates that. You tend to make more mistakes at speed chess. Uh, also, it favors the faster player. The, the younger player, in my opinion, I think it, anybody, I don't think anybody disagree with that. The younger player is going to have an advantage. So you can't compare classical ratings with faster time control ratings. Like, especially between websites, I think, because most people play online, they will play like on chess.com, on Lee Chess, and they'll be like, okay, so my Lee Chess rating is 1800. Like, is that good? But then, like, people will be like, oh no, Lee Chess is inflated. That's only like 1300 on chess.com. So people like don't have an accurate gauge. And also there is a national master title, which you are getting if you are 2200 or above. Pretty simple, but uh, when you are entering the United States, you don't have any USCF rating. So they are taking your feeder rating and matching it create, by creating your first provisional USCF rating. Usually they are giving you your feeder rating plus 50 points. So Elo, um, you know, Arpad Elo uh, was a physicist at Marquette University. Um, he was a very strong uh, chess player and he was very interested in measuring uh, chess strength. And so um, there'd been a system, particularly in the US, uh, which was um, developed by this guy Harkness, which was um, being used in the 1950s. And that was a system that just simply wasn't really working well. One of the problems with the system is that you could win all your games and you would end up losing rating points or you would win all, or you, you would uh, lose all your games and you could gain rating points. So, um, you know, ELO uh, ended up um, uh, basically determining a, um, you know, modification of uh, Harkness's system, which was a little better at, you know, figuring out how players' ratings could change, particularly taking advantage of the idea that when you started defeating players that were 
much worse than you, your rating wouldn't really go up very much. But if you defeated players who were, um, you know, stronger than you, then your rating would actually increase a lot. Uh, so that that was really essentially the essence of of ELO system. So it took hold in the U.S. I believe in 1960 or so, um, and you know it was basically uh, you know kind of uh, gaining popularity. And and you know I think um, I believe Fide uh, started taking notice. Fide started using the ELO rating system officially in July 1971. Before that, they were unofficial lists developed by our pad ELO. He started his work and publishing it in June 1967, and FIDE started using them officially from July 1971. In the last couple of years, chess has enjoyed a surge of participation that has been compared to the Fisher boom. The popularity of the Netflix series The Queen's Gambit based on the 1983 novel by Walter Tevis, combined with the COVID-19 shutdown to cause major retailers to sell out of chess sets. On chess.com alone, over three quarters of a billion chess games were played in 2021, when 5.3 million new members joined the site. Online chess has proven to be a fantastic entry point for beginners, as well as a place for experienced players to improve. The United States Chess Federation is the governing body of American chess. Those wanting to progress to over-the-board chess can become members and earn a rating, which is based on your performance against other rated players. USChess.org lists membership prices, allows you to search for local chess clubs and upcoming tournaments in your area, and records of individual players and tournaments are stored there. US Chess keeps record of several ratings for each member based on category. The regular, quick, and blitz ratings are all over-the-board ratings based on a tournament's time control. Some online tournaments are U.S. chess-rated events, where members can earn separate, regular, quick, and blitz ratings. Many members even have a separate correspondence chess rating through U.S. chess. Along with FIDE ratings given to international players for over-the-board play, chess.com ratings, liechess.org ratings, chess24.com ratings, chessclub.com ratings. Well, you're beginning to see that a lot of effort has gone into trying to quantify just how good a chess player is. But this is an effort that began very long time ago. The idea of establishing a ranking or rating classes for players goes all the way back more than a thousand years. In the uh, latter medieval period, the Arab chess writers established their own system. Uh, the top level was called, uh, we translated as grandee, similar to grandmaster, but the lowest level was uh, called beneath contempt. So uh, the idea of the ranking system goes all the way back. Certainly if you go back far enough, um, you know, invitations to major tournaments uh, were based on reputation or at least performance in certain uh, certain tournaments. But there was no, um, you know, no formalized way of actually estimating strength before, um, you know, really before ELO and, and Harkness and then um, this other guy, Hoslinger, who, who developed another system that was used in Germany starting in the late 40s, but never really uh, got a lot of um, a lot of attention. Now, as of the really about the uh, 19th century, it became more common to use the odds that were given. If you gave pawn and move odds, that meant that you gave up a pawn and you allowed the uh, F pawn and you allowed your opponent to uh, move first. And the reason for giving up the F pawn was it greatly restricted Black's moves at that point. So that was probably the lowest form of um, odds. And then they could give pawn in two where your opponent could make two moves before you moved. And then a knight odds where you gave up your queen knight usually and rook odds where you gave up your queen rook and queen odds where you gave up your queen and players would be uh, classified informally based on the odds they required from the strongest players so if you say so and so was a pawn and move player that meant that he had to uh, accept pawn and move odds against a strong player but there was no numerical system when Paul Morphy uh, declared 
first that he was he would only play at pawn and move odds, giving the odds, after winning the first American Chess Congress. He, in effect, was saying he was in a rating class by himself. Uh, he expanded that to he would only accept pawn and move odds from players in England, and finally from any player in the world, which was his way, in my view, of saying I'm the world champion. There's one thing I'll say about Morphy, and it, it was mentioned um, in uh, the rating of chess players past and present by Arpad Elo, uh, that, uh, and, and I can't remember when the book came out, I guess in the 1970s, there were basically two guys, according to the his system, and, you know, it's just numbers, it's not prejudice there. There were two guys who really stood out in that they were, uh, up until that time, uh, they were about 100 rating points above the next ranked player. And they were about uh, 200 uh, rating points, which is what they call a class interval over the uh, the top the the average of the the top ten, so it's it's Morphy and, and Fisher, two two Americans who you know at their peak they really put a very considerable distance between them and their their contemporaries. And what do you think about modern efforts to give players from the past like Morphy a rating, and uh, what does it even mean to have a twenty six hundred or something back then? Uh, yeah, it's hard to really make a lot of sense out of um, assigning a, a rating to to Morphe because again, um, you know what exactly are you comparing it to? You can't really compare that twenty six hundred strength then to what it means to have a twenty six hundred strength now, uh, just because that you know that connection is, is very tenuous. Um, so it's very difficult to to really make much sense out of it. Um, you know, one one other area that um, that you know, is has a slightly different uh, flavor to it um, that arguably, um, you know, could, you know, if developed properly, could actually have some uh, way of understanding ability is to, you know, develop a system where you have uh, strong computer programs evaluate players' moves. But like, we're not quite at the point where I think we can trust uh, computer uh, computer programs' abilities at um, converting move evaluations into actual chess ratings, but that's like, that's an area of, of, uh, of, of, of research, really. I mean, there, there are some attempts at it, but um, I haven't seen anything that's been, you know, completely, um, you know, completely convincing. And they also use terms like first class, second class, first rate, and those were so informal that first rate could refer to the best in a country or it could refer to the best in a club. It could be anything. Second rate, of course, was somewhat derogatory. Third rate, you know, they, they were really putting you down. The uh, president, uh, James Garfield, the U.S. president, was a, considered a very strong chess player. And one, uh, during his campaign, someone said that uh, General Garfield, as he was at that time, would be a first rate in any club. So you can see how imprecise the term was. You know, Tall's rating versus Caruana's, does that mean if they played, that would give us an idea of how it would come out, or is it just within the context of their generation where it's useful? Uh, I, I think this is a, com I, I think, uh, this is a complete misunderstanding of how the uh, rating system works. Uh, the rating system, uh, as I understand it, it is a measure of performance against uh, contemporaries. So you simply cannot compare a number from a particular time and, you know, say a, a player with 2,500 in, you know, whichever year it was and a player with 2,500 today. To say that they're both 2,500, you know, 2,500, therefore they're of equal strength. That's not how the rating system works. I don't think it's the best way of doing it. These days, because we have computers, 
which can actually analyse players' moves directly. You can develop much more accurate systems of comparing play from uh, one generation to the next just by a raw check of the moves that were played. So if you were to look back in history to someone like Steinitz, you'll find that his games are much less accurate than someone like Magnus Carlsen today. Um, now, I can understand why people are drawn to the idea of comparing peak ratings because it's quite an easy thing for anybody to do and it makes it quite good to have conversations about that sort of thing. But with a rating system, the important thing isn't necessarily the magnitude. It's a sort of relative comparison of different ratings. So if you were to add 1,000 points to every player's FIDE rating, it wouldn't make any difference, would it? Because it would the differences remain the same. But um, if you're actually comparing magnitudes, in my opinion, that's not a very helpful thing to compare for that reason. But I also think that the more modern techniques of comparing moves directly with engines and seeing how good they were on an absolute basis is a better way of doing that if that's what people want to do. And so this was um, something that comes up a lot with the kids in my chess club where they'll compare uh, Carlson's rating to Fisher's or something like that. Is there any use in comparing uh, players from different eras? It's really hard to do that and be uh, assured at all that it's going to make much sense. Um, I, there, there are a whole bunch of, uh, of papers that have tried to address this question. For, for a while, um, uh, there were some uh, statisticians and you know, I suppose non-statisticians too that were playing with this data set that examined all the head-to-head -head, uh, matchups between top players over time. Um, you know, I think even going back to you know, Morphe and Anderson, and then I think it goes up through around Fisher, and then it stops. Um, but basically trying to get a sense for um, how, um, you know, how, how strong were all these players against each other. Against each other. And so you can perform the exercise of, of uh, you know, trying to estimate everybody's strength just from all these head-to-head -head competitions of, of these top players. And you realize pretty quickly that a big complication is that um, you know, players are improving over time. And so you might have, for example, you know, um, you know, Capablanca is playing Alakine and, and, you know, it seems like Alakine is starting to, you know, defeat Capablanca much more often than, than uh, Capablanca is winning. And that's really more of a virtue of Capablanca being on the decline later in his career and Alakine coming, uh, you know, coming up. Um, and so that generally tends to happen with, um, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, the, these kinds of data sets where you're trying to make sense out of players from different eras and try to connect them over time. Because like once you start having, you know, players uh, of one era that are at the end of their career starting to play um, other players that are starting at the beginning of their career, it starts to be tricky to figure, disentangle, you know, what are their relative strains. That's one issue. But then there's the second issue, which is probably even harder to disentangle, which is that the knowledge of chest strength is, is essentially um, improving over time and not at any kind of uniform rate. Um, so just as, as an example, if you take players that were you know, competing in say the early 1900s and you think about what they knew at the time, you know, they, they, were, they were mostly playing um, very you know, kind of classical style chess, like in the spirit of, I don't know, like, like Rubinstein, for example, but then you start getting into the 1920s and 30s, and you have a hypermodern school of chess where you have like Reddy and Tartikover that are coming along. And that's like a whole new set of, of tools that they're using to understand how to play chess. And so if you start thinking about how to compare um, the strength of players in the 1930s, say, versus players in the very, very early 1900s, they're working with a different, different knowledge base. So it's very hard to disentangle that in just being able to just zone in on what are the, the true strengths of these players uh, to be able to compare players of different eras. So I, I would say that the best you can hope for is to be able to do something like assess in any um, fixed point in time how good the top players are and how much better they are than their, you know, their cohort. When you compare players of different eras by rating, 
you know, let's let's look at that. What does that mean? All right, look at Bobby Fischer. People know Bobby Fischer, world champion. I mean, he was when he hit the seventies. I mean, you don't go through the field he went through six zero six zero, and you know, a former world champion. Uh, you know, picked the scores like four and a half, two and a half, or five and a half, two. I forget exactly what it was. I mean, he just split it, but. Eventually, the rating might have hit 2,700 in FIDE. I'm not sure, maybe 2,680. And then you get a Kasparov or uh, Magnus Carlson's rating is 28-something. And that's huge. But that doesn't mean anything. Fisher couldn't. Fisher lost rating points defeating Spassky, an S world champion, soundly because of the way the rating system went. You know, he was expected to, for that rating gap to win so many games, and he didn't quite do that. But the real test is not the number, but the spread between him and the next highest player. That's what you look at. It's the delta rating that's important. Well, it does seem like the number one is somehow tethered to number two, that at a certain point he almost has to win every game to gain points. Yeah, yeah that's the problem with it. Yeah, if they're, fur if they're, if they're further down than 200 points, you're, you, you stop. That's it. You can't, I, mean, I shouldn't say stop, but if you take a look, 400 points is zero. If you have a 400 point gap, you gain no rating points. If it's 200 points, you might get one or two points. But one of these, yeah, you got to bet it's 2750. You nix you for a draw and you're going to lose a lot of points. So it's the rating system has that. So, but still, that gap is important. The 200 point gap is just says, yeah, you're, you're just in another world. You know, these guys can't compete with you. But in terms of Magnus Carlson, it definitely matters because at that level, the players are so good. There's sort of this like really high draw rate that they have to overcome to keep their rating that high. So when Magnus says, I want to reach 2,900, if no one's over 2,800 currently, that's just insane. Like he has to probably win 20% of his games if there's going to be 80% draws and never lose a single game, or maybe it's 30% wins. Um, so yeah, it definitely matters. Like what's the the top players in your pool you're competing against. If you're at the very top, you can really only get so much higher than them. If you begin your count with Wilhelm Steinitz, 16 chess players have been world champion, and only 14 players have managed a peak FIDE rating over 2,800. Only four of those 14, Grandmasters Carlson, Kasparov, Anand, and Kramnik, have also been world champion. One reason for this is that the vast majority of these 2,800 club members our current day rivals. Gary Kasparov is the only player on the list to top 2800 prior to the year 2000. Current world champion Magnus Carlsen has achieved the highest FIDE rating of 2882 and has suggested that he may abandon the world championship to focus on his pursuit of a 2900 rating. I asked Matt Jensen where I could find a month by month top player list for the last several decades and he sent me a link to 2700chess.com. I wanted to find who the most dominant player has been since 1971, when FIDE, the governing body for international chess, adopted the ELO rating system. I went page by page, writing down notable gaps between numbers 1 and 2 in the world. Monthly records for Fisher's era were not available, but even when you checked in on him once a year, his dominance over every other chess player in the world was crystal clear. Using the gap between numbers 1 and 2 throughout the last five decades as a measuring stick, I was able to make a list of the most dominant chess players of the last half century. Bobby Fischer took first place with a staggering 125 point lead over Boris Spassky in 1972, followed by a 120 point lead over Anatoly Karpov the next year. Garry Kasparov was next with an 82 point advantage over Vichy Anand in 2000. Fischer and Kasparov were proven overwhelmingly to be the most dominant players of the last 50 years. Each of the top 10 ratings gaps I was able to find belonged to one or the other. Magnus Carlsen took 11th place on the list in 2013 with a whopping 74 point lead over Vladimir Kramnik. Anatoly Karpov held his greatest lead in January of 1982, 65 points ahead of Timon. In the 20th century, there was a movement toward classifying. Uh, a little more precisely in Russia and the Soviet Union as early as probably around 1910 or 1920 they were using a category system where if you 
had won and made a certain score in a, a certain tournament, you could go up from fifth category to fourth category to third to second to first, and then you moved into the candidate master and the master categories. But that was not numerical, it was an approximation, but it was getting closer to that. That system has been in the, well, it was in Russia for so many years, and as late as the 1980s, they wanted to get rid of the ELO rating system and go back to just the category system. But they were still using it. They had a television tuition program in the 70s where if you subscribe to the TV series and you mailed in so many correct answers, they would bump you up another category or two. So it was a way of encouraging uh, young players. Eventually they eliminated the fifth category, but Boris Spassky said when he first started playing seriously, he was no better in the third category, so he moved up pretty rapidly. Now the numerical systems, probably Correspondence Chess uh, was the first. I remember the Correspondence Chess League of America developed a sort of uh, rating system. The, uh, the U.S. Uh, magazine Chess Review began with a rating system. And then around 1950, give or take a couple of years, Kenneth Harkness, who was a major official in the U.S. Chess Federation, began to develop a rating system for over-the-board chess. And in fact, we discovered and rescued the notebook we believed he used to compute and to develop the system. It was very close to being thrown out as trash, and it was saved and it's now an exhibit at the World Chess Hall of Fame. His handwritten notes about players and tournaments from which he developed the rating system. U.S. Chess had fewer than 10,000 members for all years prior to 1968. Membership numbers soared to nearly 60,000 during the Fisher boom, when Bobby Fisher's dominance sparked an enormous interest in chess across the nation. A slight dip followed, but then steadily rose to nearly 100,000 members before the COVID-19 shutdown. As chess clubs reopen, membership to U.S. Chess is recovering quickly. Many of those joining U.S. Chess so that they can compete in rated tournaments may be wondering, what exactly is a good rating? Many parrot the idea that 1,200 represents a beginner's level, though the data doesn't seem to support this. In fact, only about one-third of U.S. Chess members enjoy a rating above 1,200. It could be that people have their own definition of what beginner means, but if we define it as the first established rating published for a player, the answer of the average beginner's rating is attainable. An established U.S. chess rating means a player has played at least 26 games. This eliminates those who played only a few games before quitting without excluding those who went on to become titled players. Chess rivals baseball as the most statistic-rich sport, so using the online database kept by U.S. Chess, which goes back to 1991, I randomly collected hundreds of ratings. I wrote down the first established regular rating for each, and even when my finger landed on Tatev Abrahamian's mammoth first established rating, the average was not pulled up anywhere near 1,200. When I averaged the first established regular rating of current U.S. chess members, I came up with 957. When I ignored whether a member was lapsed or current, the first established rating went down to 877. More than half of active players are rated below 1,000. And, as mentioned before, two-thirds of U.S. chess members have a rating below 1,200. The top 25% manage a rating of 1,400 or above. At 1,400, a player earns a rating floor, above the universal floor of 100. From that point forward, a 1,400's rating will not drop below 1,200. If they get to 1,500, their rating will not drop below 1,300, and so on. No, I never heard about rating floors before I came here. Yeah, here they're providing you rating floors, so you cannot be doing probably some cheating over your ratings. Like you're a good player, and you're playing badly, and you're going down, and you can play some sections. Those under 1800, under 2000, and where you can get your prizes. Because prizes here are quite generous for lower sections. But if you're a good player, and you are going down and after they're starting to move between like under 2000, under 1800 and getting all those prizes is probably seriously unfair. Oh, I see. And I totally agree with this. Yeah. In Ukraine, you have some prizes for s like lower rated sections, 
but our prizes are definitely not something what to fight for. It's not something say. to lose points on purpose for to get in? No, 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 no. You, you, you cannot make life out of this. No, it's like you're playing for nine days, you're trying very hard and you are getting like $10. Only about 10% of U.S. chess players who have played a game in the last year are A players. This means they have achieved a rating between 1800 and 1999. At a rating of 2000, a player is considered an expert and is among the top 5% of players in the country. A national master title is awarded to a player who reaches a rating of 2200. These players are in the top 2% of American chess players. A rating of 2475 gets you on the top 100 players in the country list. And if you want to compete with Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, you need to stop watching this video and start practicing, because his peak U.S. chess rating is 2919. I think the players are a lot stronger now than they were back in the Fisher era. There's just a lot more resources available, and these newer players have learned from players of the past. In my opinion, though, like, if you set, like, any of the top 10 players nowadays against the top 10 players 50 years ago, like the ones 50 years ago don't really see much of a chance just because like we have engines now. I believe in the evolution of chess. So I believe that players right now are even more prepared than players on the past, but mostly because we have learned from them. And right now with computers, books, uh, information, uh, ways to play chess every day if you want to, of course, the computer allows these kids to program themselves. Uh, chess is programming. It's a language. There's no question about that. And the more positions you understand, formations you understand, which pieces are suited best to these types of pawn structures, which pieces they trade off. And traditionally, if you've gone over thousands of games, which they have, and these kids can pick that up really fast going through the computer. In 2001, I started teaching online courses about chess and education. Most recently, in April of 2022, I became Chief Science Officer for Chessable. Chessable is based on science-based learning to help users improve at chess. So Chessable has an interest in science and is supportive of researchers all over the world who are investigating questions about chess. So as Chief Science Officer, one of the things I'm going to establish are Chessable Research Awards for undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty advisors to those students to support them financially as they do research about chess. Um, the research grants I'm intending, or research, sorry, chessable research awards that I'm intending are for any area of chess endeavor, but the limitation is gonna be, it has to be an undergraduate or graduate student because we're, who has a faculty research sponsor. And the reason for that is we want to generate articles and projects that will be respected in the academic world because you may know like the gold standard in the academic world is peer-reviewed articles where you know anyone can publish anything on the internet but a peer-reviewed article means that your peers other professors and researchers have vetted your material and found it sound and that's what we're hoping to generate well, i think like places like chess.com and some arena and other ratings all the things that they have established them because there is a demand for them. People want ratings, people like them, people want to compare, people want to track their progress. It's definitely more accurate to have a rating system where you enter a random pool and then there's some rules about the pairings, like you have to be close to your opponent's rating, for example. Um, being able to select your opponent can help you kind of game the system a little bit. But I will say, if you're playing online chess, you can easily get thousands of games in. And those ratings tend to be more accurate, I think, than over the board because they use the Glico system, which will give you a smaller rating deviation value if you play a lot of games. So play hundreds or thousands of games every year. Those ratings are going to be very precise for that time control and website. Whereas if you're playing over the board USCF, let's say, a lot of players struggle to get more games in than four or five a month, even when they're active, right? They might just play in one weekend event or a weekly club event, one game a night. So if you're a quickly improving player playing over the board, you could be hundreds of points below your skill level and your rating just can't quite catch up. Um, you know, having having chess performance, uh, being uh, playing online is, uh, you know, is, is a 
somewhat of a different skill than playing over the board. I mean, even like an online play, you know, if you're very good at like pre-moving, for example, that's a skill that you can't quite do in over the board games. And that can often make the difference between a, a win and a loss in online play. Playing over the board and playing online, it's just different. Some people are better at playing online, better at fast time controls, and some people are better at over the board. So like, you know, someone who's 1800 on chess.com in rapid might be like 1500 USCF strength, but another person who's 1800 might be like 2000 USCF strength. So it's like kind of hard to tell sometimes. Well, chess has a ball, and thanks to computer, you can prepare one one opening right now. Like uh, you can go the morning, and then you can play it. You can play it against anyone just because of thanks to the computer and their information and all of these uh, engines. And yeah, they didn't like people from the past, like Fisher had to work. Uh, if he wanted to like play an opening, he had to work a lot. Uh, but right now it's, it's too easy with the computers. So for non-chess players, mm -hmm. I think most people assume that ratings always go up because most different games and things that you play, it's more of a points-based system where you can just accumulate points as you go and you always move up. Um, chess is kind of a humbling game in that sense because you either go up or down and it's based on your skill level and there's not a lot of luck involved. Um, so I think that's the biggest misunderstanding for non-chess players is that the rating always goes up. And I think for players who play online, the biggest misunderstanding about ratings is that ratings across different platforms should be similar. Um, I've done a lot of work on this trying to map different rating systems, and we can talk about that in a different question if you want. But I find that some players think, you know, 1900 on one website is the same as 1900 FIDE and 1900 on another website, but that's not necessarily true. Yeah, this is something that I've been kind of interested in the past year or so um, as I'm helping other players improve their chess games is trying to keep chess fun and realizing what will motivate you to keep playing. Um, so outside of chess, I like to read books on sort of like habits and motivation and things like that kind of self-help books. And I've realized it's, it's super important to just be motivated to keep working on your chess and to form habits where you keep consistently working at it. Um, I find that the current rating systems can be demotivating for a lot of players because for some reason, it, on average, I think it feels worse to lose 50 points on your rating than it feels good to gain 50 points. There's just something about those expectations we set for ourselves um, and ratings are just, they're kind of brutal in a way, right? You're having a bad day. You might drop a hundred points in blitz. <laughs> it's just, you're going to, that could affect the rest of your day and then you're not going to want to play blitz for a while. Or if you reach a certain new peak, you might just stop playing because you're like, hey, I hit 1604. I've been trying to hit 1600. I'm just going to stop playing for now. So I think the ratings can be demotivating sometimes for players. Um, that's why I think these websites should come out with kind of points-based systems on the side and maybe even make that the main thing you look at. So like your ratings are accessible, but they're not the front thing that people see when they go to your profile page. Um, and I like how chess.com added the league system recently because it kind of matches like, I think Duolingo has something similar for learning languages where you can kind of just keep leveling up. You get things like XP points. Um, Chessable does a great job with that, keeping players motivated. Because uh, I think it's something where you just want people to have fun playing chess and learning. And a system where you can always improve is a nice way to do that. Also, chess is becoming, um, or is getting more popular nowadays. And many people are going there and are now playing on chess.com. Uh, it's a great website. And yeah, then they, they, they usually I, 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 I teach and some of them um, kind of uh, ask me like, okay, if I will get a, a, a rating on a USCF rating, what my, my rating will be? What do you think? And in chess.com, um, is uh, I would say the closest website that you can get the closest rating with the USCF is ob obviously not the same. I mean, right. I mean, so like, you know, recognizing that even like at this point in time, having, having different meanings of ratings in different places just kind of emphasizes how hard it is to even think about comparing players at different eras. 
and, and that's not, you know, and, and to take it even one step further, you know, playing online um, and having a rating system online compared to, you know, over the board ratings is another different animal. And, and those also could be um, nearly impossible to uh, compare with any kind of precision. So, you, you know, you have like, say, chess.com's rating system or Lee Chess's uh, rating system. And then, you know, say uh, the U.S. Chess Federation's or U.S. Chess's rating system. I mean, they're all, um, you know, measuring, um, you know, kind of, they're all measuring chest strength, but but chest strength um, in different ways and, you know, based on different pools of players and pools of players that might be evolving uh, quite differently. And so it gets to be very difficult to uh, draw any direct comparisons among all three of those rating systems, for example. That's not to say that, you know, I mean, this, this sounds like such a gloom and doom um, conclusion, um, you know, rating systems actually uh, are, are quite good at being able to uh, estimate uh, relative abilities if used properly. Like if you're, you know, they're especially good, like if you're trying to, you know, figure out like what the expected outcomes are going to be amongst players that are competing against each other, typically in the same, you know, the same area, same geographic area, um, you know, for, for, uh, you know, tournaments that are upcoming. So they're, they're very good that way. And that's, that's generally how they're used anyway. You know, be, you know, cause like you're, you, you, you know, typically in tournaments, you're seeding players according to the ratings or you're sectioning players according to ratings. And, you know, in that use of ratings, they're actually quite effective. The influence of computers has fully saturated the game of chess, impacting not only ratings, but tournament strategy and player strength. Even the tournament director's job is made easier, as the pairings are made in seconds by computer software, instead of the TD carrying a stack of cards in the rule book to a quiet room to sort out who plays who next. In the mid-1980s, things began to change in a significant way, as chess base was born. Titled players no longer had to search the world for chess magazines, chess books, or a secret informant to find out what openings a new opponent plays. This also meant that players, who sometimes relied upon a faulty line, whose faults could not be figured out while the chess clock was ticking, had to come up with something new. Club players benefited as well as they could soon click through known games of every world champion if they liked. The education of new players transformed. Gone were the days of being the only kid at your school who likes chess, so you stopped playing. The popular Chess Master video game was soon available for PCs and video game consoles. You could play as many games as you wanted against the computer, which could be set to a variety of strength levels, and later versions included lessons from grandmasters. Frank Camarado was a leader in dealing with this. When home chess computers first came out, the uh, companies producing them would claim that, you know, it plays in an 1800 level or it plays in a 1900 level. And they would not have any real basis for that claim. And so uh, Frank actually set up a computer rating agency that required that the computer back to be actually tested and by objective standards before they can advertise any particular rating. Years ago, there was an issue of people could enter a computer in a regular tournament. They could just sign it up and pay a membership. Today, the once unattainable Chessic wisdom of grandmasters is freely available to all on YouTube. Clubs like the St. Louis Chess Club have built enormous video libraries that are free to anyone with internet access. Many titled players have their own channels and post every day. If you don't mind spending some money, you can access thousands of hours of video on sites like Chessable, which dive deeper into specific areas of chess, like certain openings. I didn't include that in my DVD. At the highest levels of chess, the chess engines have transformed the game. Grandmasters can seek out novelties to confuse future opponents by setting up a position on their computers and going out to see a movie. When they come back, the engine might have a gift waiting. Even if club players never use engines themselves, they're likely learning from the games of titled players who do, or playing against someone who does. Kids who learn the game today have an enormous advantage over past generations. There's no limit to how many games they can play. They have access to hundreds of thousands of Grandmaster games online. They have countless hours of video lessons from titled players available for free. They can make use of their time riding in the back seat working tactic puzzles on mom's phone or repeating opening lines a hundred times until they're memorized. Which leads us to the next topic impacting chess ratings, the trouble with kids these days. There have also been a number of 
uh, things which have affected the rated rating system over the years. It's not been completely steady. Uh, it was inflationary. They lowered the base. You would really need some, um, uh, you know, proper mathematician, somebody like John Nunn, uh, to talk about uh, this. I mean, uh, some of the things, my opinions, I, I have got from 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 talking to John Nunn. Yeah, at the time, just a minute, that's what I said. Originally, federating the floor for federating was twenty two hundred. There was like a few hundred people in the world. Okay, five, six hundred maybe people in the world at that time in this level. And now we have like one thousand something grandmasters, only grandmasters, and then nobody knows how many international masters and then feeder masters. This pyramid becomes bigger, the floor becomes bigger. And they, they, they started to make it lower, so, so the, the pyramid is going like, <laughs> base becomes bigger. Yeah, so the, 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 there's a, 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 a kind of a subtle way that inflation uh, can arise if, um, if the criterion for um, entry into a rating system is that you have to have a certain rating coming in. So what's going to happen is that people entering into, into the system, there's going to be quite a few of those players that are going to get into the system because they were actually weaker players than 2200 but just happened to have a good performance. The one thing that uh, John actually, he surprised me with, uh, he, he said uh, that the rating system is inherently deflationary. And we're actually starting to see that now, uh, that uh, there are fewer players uh, with rated over 2,700, today than there were some some years ago and you know because if you, if you have a rate of <laughs> of uh, uh you know whatever 2400 and you you drop dead uh those points have just disappeared from the system but when you come on the system and you start going up you're actually taking points away from other people when you you are Im, imp, improving but then actually if you simply at some, at some point drop dead they just it's out of the system altogether so it's it's a loss of points uh to the system so there there is a a, a sort of uh, inherent deflationary uh, side to the, the, the rating system. It, it is interesting to study, for example, if you'll take, for example, guy number 100 and look through last 30 years, what was the rating of the guy number 100? So you, you can see already somewhere not on the very, very top, but somewhere there. So you will see that, for example, in the last 20 years, it is even going a little bit lower. It is still around 2710, I think. Oh, no, 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 I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's about 2660. 2660, and it is somewhere there for the last 20 years and even a little bit going lower. And there are many reasons for this. Once again, because pyramid became taller and the base became wider, right? So there are many people of very low rating are entering the stuff. And very often it happens with youngsters. So let's say kid, school kid coming in, getting his first rating somewhere about 1200, playing for six, seven years, his rating going from 1200 to 2200. He's adding up 1000 points. He's sucking it up from others. And then he quits. He goes to college and he quits. 1000 points were sucked from the system. You're right. So the floor was originally 2200. And then it's steadily gone down over time. So it's gone down now to a thousand. So anybody who has a rating over a thousand is on the list. If you go below that, you come off the list. I don't know if there's been inflation or deflation. I, I just described the problems we've observed in some countries. And they do tend to be in that sort of a thousand, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred part of the list. Because the problem is being caused by new juniors playing and that's possibly to do with how they get their initial rating but it's also because they are if they're playing in you know 
the Athens under eight championships, then they're probably going to play other under eights in Athens and they'll play maybe under tens in Athens when they get a little bit older. But they're not going to play in a local club against adult players because they're probably not good enough to handle that standard at that point of their development. So they will come on the list quite low. Because they are playing only other juniors, they will stay quite low. Or at the very worst, they'll pass points between each other and not sort of add points to the system, which they would do if they played adults. So they tend to sort of get stuck. Um, so I'm not sure if that counts as deflation so much as stretching. Um, certainly stretching is what we are, what we have observed in those cases. At the top end, we believe it's actually pretty stable. There's no one running away to unprecedented heights. OK, Magnus Carlsen is the number one in the world. On rating, he's number one by quite a sizable distance at the moment. But that's not particularly any anything different from what happened you know, 10 years ago. It, he, he's been number one for quite a while now, and he's not sort of disappeared off to 2,900, 3,000, 3,100. You know, the rating system is really meant to always have your rating show exactly what your skill level is. And if you're improving quickly and your rating is keeping up with that because you play so many games online, it doesn't really affect the other players in the pool. Um, where you run into problems is, for example, in the U.S., if you're playing FIDE rated events, there's almost no FIDE rated events. So it really highlights this problem. And you could be someone who's played chess for 30 or 40 years, and maybe your FIDE rating in the U.S. is fairly close to your USCF and where it should be because it's stabilized. You'll run into a young player who is rated like 2100 USCF and their FIDE rating will say 1700 because their last FIDE event was like a year ago and that was their skill level back then. Um, so yeah, the more games you can play, the more accurate it is. The basic way to understand, I think, uh, rating inflation and deflation is to really understand kind of at its core what a rating is. So the way that I tend to think of it, and this is, you know, as somebody who really has spent a lot of their um, their career, you know, performing research on, on, uh, on developing rating systems and understanding ratings, is that basically everybody um, kind of walks around with uh, essentially two numbers. One number is their true strength, a true rating. Like it's a rating that you don't actually know. Uh, but it's like kind of part of you, like that's the strength that you're actually playing at at any given moment. Meanwhile, there's also a rating that gets computed, which is based on your results against the opponents that you've been playing. And that's a number that's just an estimate of whatever your true rating is. And it's, it, you know, it, it's nearly certain that your um, computed rating, that the one that gets published, is not going to be exactly equal to your your true unknown rating that is your true strength that that you're playing at the level of what the the goal of any rating system then is to try to get as much accuracy in estimating players true strengths as much as possible and the problem uh, that where you get inflation and deflation where that comes about is that if you have a rating system that's not very good at tracking uh, players true strengths and somehow fails in a more systematic way the the most obvious way, and probably the um, the way certainly in the U.S. where uh, you see that kind of failure is in being able to estimate the strengths of young players, like scholastic players, because the rating formulas say that here's what you should do when, when players um, have certain game results. And so you just follow those formulas. But meanwhile, it may very well be that these scholastic players are improving much faster than the rating can track. So the problem is that those formulas are going to end up computing these ratings that are not necessarily going to be high enough relative to how strong the actual player is because their true rating is actually going up faster than the rating system is going to track. So what ends up happening is that if you have a rating system whose formulas are such that they're not actually tracking the player's underlying true rating fast enough, you're going to see rating deflation. So the reason rating deflation is occurring really is that you basically have all of these players whose um, true abilities are much higher, and these are typically, again, younger players, their true, their true ability is much higher than their actual rating, 
And so what ends up happening is that when they start playing in future events, they're going to be playing against opponents where their rating might be reported or, or published as a like 1500, but their true strength is 1700. And what's going to happen is that they're going to do much better against their opponents than the rating suggests they are. And then those opponents are going to have ratings that are going to go down there for So it, it's the point is that it's not inevitable that um, a rating system is going to exhibit inflation or deflation, deflation in, in the case of uh, the U.S. Chess Federation. The way to fix the problem is to make sure that you have a rating system that is designed to track ability more accurately. So, for example, um, you know, one, one thing that one could do in, in developing a rating system, and this isn't something that is done, but what you could do is you could actually in, you can actually have the system have increases that are bigger for younger players as they're in a period of their lives where you know that they're likely to be improving. You would actually give them bigger rating jumps um, for, for their uh, good results while they're younger, but don't give such big uh, rating jumps when they're um, you know, in more adult years. In, in, the, um, in the U.S. Chess Federation rating system, for example, one thing that we do that, that ELO never really um, uh, considered very seriously is uh, to award, uh, at least in the, you know, the kind of the language of, of the U.S. Chess Federation, uh, the, the rating system gives um, uh, bonus points. USCF has done a good job adding bonus points to try to account for that. So if you're improving really quickly or if you get a perfect score in an event and you have a young age, you can get bonus points for that tournament. But I think they could still do an even better job. Yeah, I, I think kids tend to be underrated over the board. And online truly reflects their skill level. Um, so one other thing I'll say on that is I've found that if you see a young player or a player who's improving very quickly and their online rating, like let's say chess.com blitz, is three or four hundred points above their USCF or FIDE rating, when you would expect the two to be similar almost always that player is going to gain over the board rating points once they get back to playing well over the board. Like it's, it's almost a guarantee, like especially for the young players who reach that, you know, 2,300 blitz and you look in their 1,800 USCF, they're always ready to just get to that master level in a year or two. And bonus points were something that were developed, I think, pretty early on. I want to say they were implemented in the 1970s, but then they were, um, I think they disappeared for a while, um, but the purpose of, and then they, they were brought back again, but the purpose of bonus points is that if players are performing exceptionally well, much better than the rating would predict, then you give them an extra bonus to the rating to really push their uh, ratings up. And the hope is that by doing so, you're, you're actually kind of catching up what their estimated rating is to their true underlying rating. Um, so this was about age. Is it harder to gain rating points uh, for older players? Yeah, so this is something that uh, I've researched. We asked players with the chess goal survey, what's your age is one of the questions. And the things that I realized that matter most in terms of chess improvement are number one, how many hours a week you spend on chess, which makes sense. Uh, number two is what is your current rating? So the higher your rating is, the harder it is to gain points. So gaining 100 points at a 900 rating tends to be easier or comes more quickly than gaining 100 points at a 1900 rating, for example. And the third thing that matters is age, but it matters the least out of the three, which I think is the most encouraging part. So as we get older, it does become more and more difficult to improve. But I found that a lot of players are still improving their ratings even into their 60s. So I think really where it becomes the most difficult is if you're getting um, your rating up, let's say, right around the 2000 mark and your age is maybe hitting the 60s or older, I think that's the point where it becomes really difficult to gain rating points. But overall, you know, we can definitely still gain as adults. And the biggest recommendation I have for adults to improve is make sure to keep playing games. Make sure to keep playing games, track your mistakes, track your common takeaways, and use that to help dictate what things you need to work on. While few invest the hours of daily work it takes to earn a title in chess, nearly every club player has imagined the honor of being awarded one. U.S. Chess awards the national master title to the strongest American players, 
and some other countries have similar national titles. The more coveted international titles are granted by FIDE, the governing body of international chess. This includes the best known and highest title of Grand Master. The Grand Master title has become so revered that its origin story has become the stuff of legends. Well, those, you're probably referring to the story of the Tsar Nicholas II, who was the last Russian Tsar, conferred the title of Grand Master on the top five players in the 1914 St. Petersburg tournament. That's widely accepted, but it's very questionable. I've, I've read the book, the tournament book of St. Petersburg 1914, and there's no reference whatsoever to that. And that book has some media accounts of the tournament, and there's no reference in the media accounts. And one researcher has uh, determined that Tsar Nicholas was not even in St. Petersburg in that period. Plus, the term Grand Master went back for decades before that tournament. I think that's probably a myth, that's just my opinion. Um, Tsar Nicholas did donate a prize to the tournament, and they did use the term Grand Masters, which meant the best masters in different countries. Uh, and I think somebody combined the two ideas that the Tsar gave him a prize and they called them Grand Masters, therefore the Tsar had conferred the title. Now, you know, it's not proven one way or the other, but I'm skeptical that that occurred. The title concept, probably, you know, Russia was among the early pioneers, at least in the early 20th century. They even prior to that, they would sometimes have tournaments where they would classify players as class A or B or C, based on strength and have different sections. So it was not a definite invention. It was kind of an evolution of step by step of the concept. Okay. The term Grand Master, which was usually then written as two words, uh, went back well into the 19th century. Uh, Sam Lloyd, the famous problem composer, was what's called uh, the Grand Master of Problem Composition. And that was decades before, well, I was in the late 19th century. The word master actually may have come from the concept of a teacher being an expert in an area back in the 18th century. In my research, I found that if they referred to a chess master, it was often a person who was a teacher, a writer, and also a strong player. And they kind of transferred into just a strong player. And the term master became common in the uh, 19th century. Uh, the term Grandmaster was only rarely used, like uh, Anderson in Germany was called the Grandmaster of Germany. That was back in Morphy's day. That was a reference to he was the strongest of the masters in that country. And the term Masters continued to be used well into the 20th century, almost synonymous with Grandmasters in some cases. You, you see it used one Grandmaster in one place and Master in the other place in an international tournament. Uh, the formal granting of Grand Master really came uh, with FIDE, I believe, when they started to try to standardize the uh, title. The uh, USCF initially had a Grand Master, an American Grand Master title. Kenneth Harkness had that. But since that conflicted with international Grand Master, they changed that to senior master and they began to play with the terminology. Uh, the ratings, though, of 2200 and above are pretty well codified as master. So in U.S. chess, national master is one of the important ones. When you cross over 2200 in rating, you get a uh, that title is assuming I think you're not provisionally rated, but that's a whole nother question about provisional ratings. And then um, in FIDE, which is the International Chess Federation, there are a variety of titles, candidate master, FIDE master, international master, grand master, and then there's also woman candidate master, woman international master, uh, uh, woman grand master, and woman FIDE master. People have opinions about women's titles, 
how they're good, bad, whatever. Um, I think in my experience, they don't hurt anyone because if you're going for the main titles, you're going to go for them anyway. But for the people who maybe can't or aren't willing to put in the effort, like it's a way of encouraging people to stay in. Um, but I also have two minds about this because like I was saying that FIDE does have like some lower titles that they do use to gain money. But I think as a general rule, like women's titles have their place and maybe this is a bold proposal, but maybe one day we can have national women's titles too, because, um, you know, like FIDE events are harder to access. So like having national titles that are, where people can like easily gain us rating that might do us some good in the future so when i entered here my fide was like 2280 mm. they gave me 50 points more so i started with 2330 and then you need to play i think 25 games and provisional rating turns to real rating and i was quite successful in my first 25 games here my rating turned to up to like 2415 uscf so at the moment when I hit my 25th game, which happened, I think, in a tournament in Pigeon Forge, the official immediately gave me my national master title here because I just kind of opened here with 2400 rating that, right, you are national masters. In the most basic way, like you said, like national masters, 2200 USCF. Um, so like if you go over that in your, it doesn't even have to be published. If you go over that, like, between any tournament and the next year, a national master, even if you like go below and you never make it there again. But then FIDE is like a different rating system, first of all. So like 2200 USCF is supposed to be 2100 FIDE. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but that's just the conversion they use. And then FIDE, they have like, some of them have norms and some of them don't. So like candidate master and FIDE master and like the female equivalent of those, they just those are rating only. And I think Candidate Master is 2200 FIDE, FIDE Master is 2300. And then I am GM, Woman I am and Woman GM, they're all like rating and norms. I don't think there have been a lot of change since I just <coughs> became chair, Grandmaster. And so you need um, to play three tournaments with, I mean, you, you need to, to get three Grandmaster norms. Um, in tournaments. So, and also to half raise your the rating, you need at least to have 25 FIDE rating. So 2,500 uh, FIDE rating. And um, f uh, talking about the three grandmasters, so one norm, how can you get one norm? Well, basically you have to play one, one third of the players must be grandmasters. So if it's a, like in my case, for example, I got three norms, my three norms in nine rounds tournaments. So I faced three grandmasters in each tournament. Um, so that's, um, well, that's, that's quite important. And your performance must be 2,600 rating uh, of perform performance. I mean, performance, it must be like 26. Plus, so um, I think the other one is um, that, like federation, you can face more than I think. It's, it, if it's a night round, uh, I mean night round uh, rounds uh, tournament, you must face only six people from six chess players from your your federation, and the rest it should be like international, other play uh, from other countries. And then you also have direct titles, which is even more confusing because if you ever see like young players with not so high ratings and they have a title, that's usually like a direct title. So you can like win some continental youth championship or sometimes they have senior ones too. And if you like place top three, you get a title. That's how I got mine. And then like, for a long time, there was no rating minimum too. So I remember like funny story of seeing some children with like 
women's candidate master, women's fee day master, and they didn't even have a fee day rating because they didn't have enough games, which is kind of strange. So I think three or four years ago, they like made a rule change. So now there's rating minimums too for that. Really the use of the systematic use of Grandmaster didn't really occur until near the middle of the 20th century. And that was worldwide and then was barred into the USCF and modified again over there. And the concept of uh, the title of Life Master was created at some point. And if I remember correctly, that referred to someone who maintained a uh, master rating over about 300 consecutive games or some similar criteria. My first postal chest loss was to a life master over the board, so, you know, and, and he, he whipped me good, so he was a strong player. <laughs> now, in FIDE, it's different. Uh, FIDE does it differently. USCF is based on ratings. I'll go back to myself. What I tried to do when I came up with what I called my norms proposal is base titles on norms. Okay, if you want to be a master, you have to have a rating over 2,200 and have achieved uh, so many norms in either local, state, or national tournaments or regional tournaments. And that was set up and actually running for a while. But again, it kind of fell by the wayside. USCF tends to be very traditional and new things don't come on well. The only thing I really succeeded in doing was inducing time control, uh, uh, delay, time delay. Uh, the fact that uh, I held a patent on time delay, the first time delay clocks fully programmable was a game time that's mine. So I held that and that's the one thing it stuck. Now let it st uh, stick, it is now an international standard, time delay and accumulation of what they call bonus points or increments, you name it. My clock did all that. Uh, so that was my only real success in trying to modify the way chess is played. So this is the story how I became national master here, but in uh, Ukraine, we inherited Soviet system, and Soviet system was quite similar. The only one thing at the time when I started to play chess, there were no ratings at all. So no one cared about ratings. Every was, everything was only about norms. And the rating system was pretty similar because you had also same four, third, second, first rank, then candidate master, then master. And to get any one of those ranks, you need just to play in a tournament with, let's say, you are fourth rank player and you're pretending trying to become a third rank player so they make a qualification tournament where everybody is with fourth rank you're getting 75 percent and you're promoted to the third third rank then so far you're going to second and the first and so on so that how it was and when i started to play i was seven probably like tournament chess and at that time ratings feeder ratings there was some also soviet rating but i'm not sure about this and uh, start rating was 2200 which was impossible to to start with so this is pretty high level so no one had rating any kind of rating we're just playing for titles so i started to play i came into club for the first time they looked how i'm playing and said you're getting your fourth rank immediately just by coach is looking at you playing and said, okay, you're getting your fourth rank and you're starting to play your qualification tournaments for third rank. I played one tournament, was half a point below second tournament, half a point below for third, get my third rank in a third tournament. And then I started to play for second rank and that was already much harder. People started to beat me and I spent another maybe three years there and then uh, the person who had biggest influence in my life, in my chess life, my grandfather, he got stroke. And for next three years, it was not really something what I was interested in. So somewhere between 1991 and 1994, I didn't play at all. Those were the best times. And then in 1994, in my high school, in our, in high school, we had a coach who started to make a team. It was a pretty good team because we had five boys, four boys and one girl. And we, we started to play in some city championships and then like state championship. And my first board was future grandmaster, Yuri Drozdovsky. And the second board was future pretty strong candidate master as well, Adamov. 
And fourth board is current national international master finger. And so, ah, no, 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 he was our rival. I'm sorry, he was playing in the fourth board, but he was our, our rival. Yeah, there was pretty good tournaments at that time. And they get my second rank and first rank almost immediately. We also know that if, if we're talking about titles as well as ratings, we're not giving out huge numbers of titles that we weren't at any point in the past. We actually had a look recently at the Grand Master title. And on average, we've been giving out between 40 and 50 Grandmaster titles each calendar year, um, so which has been stable for the last at least 15 years. So we don't think that we're in any way seeing huge numbers of new Grandmasters now compared to a decade ago. We think things are relatively stable at the top end. Where we think that there are things we can improve on, I think they're at the bottom end, um, and that is something that we're going to look at over the next sort of year or so and maybe try to improve things there. Yes. Now, I won't go into a huge amount of detail here because there is a huge amount of detail. I'll start with CM and FM. So CM and FM, you just need to have a published rating over a certain number. For CM, it's 2,200. For FM, it's 2,300. You need to play 30 games to have done that just to avoid people appearing on the list and then getting their CM title and you don't see them ever again. So you need to have played 30 games and at some point in those 30 games had a rating over than that. There are safeguards built in so that people don't withdraw in the middle of a tournament to protect their rating. So if you have it on a live basis by working chronologically through the games, then that's good enough. Uh, what we don't want people to do is people to with withdraw from the tournament just because they reached the title. That's not really helpful for anybody. So those are the two easier titles to explain. International Grandmaster and Grandmaster are considerably more complicated. In principle, what you need is 27 rounds worth of norms for each title. And the most usual way of achieving that is in three tournaments, which are nine rounds long. And what you need to do is have a performance rating over 2450 for International Master and 2600 for Grandmaster. So you need to get um, your nine games. You need to have a certain mix of foreign players in your field of players that you played. You need to have a certain number of other title holders, depending on how many rounds the tournament was. And there are some fairly complicated set of criteria for all of this in the FIDE handbook. It goes to many pages, unfortunately. People think that like one necessarily implies the other. And they do correlate, but it's not completely like there's people with a title, but not so high ratings. And then there's people with really high ratings who either don't have a title for some reason or another, or their title isn't like doesn't match their strength if that makes sense so i think most like stronger players usually um look more at ratings as a better indicator of like how strong their opponent would be rather than the title itself even though obviously the title is a really big achievement the system has to be constantly monitored one problem it used to be it's less of a problem now the uh People felt that players in the South did not face as strong opposition as players in the North. And so that Southern ratings were inflated higher than they should have been. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know if it was ever demonstrated. But there you have the problem if you don't have a wide interplay of people from different regions that uh, you, know, you may tend to get rating differences based on the fact that they're not meeting each other very much. And again, the ratings committee studies the data and makes these decisions periodically. Um, and, and, you know, you hear players uh, talk about this pretty informally that, um, you know, you might, you know, people in uh, maybe New York City might say, oh, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're underrated compared to, uh, you know, players in Boston or, you know, you, you would hear uh, constantly like, um, you know, rating of 1500 
at a particular location is uh, you know stronger than rating 1500 at some other place. So I think there is actually truth to that. And the way that the way that happens is um, you know in general, at least you know at least when we're all playing in tournaments or when you have a rating system that's only rating um, competition in a face-to-face uh, over the board competition. What ends up happening is like, say in New York, you basically have players in a particular locale that are only pretty much competing against each other. And so you basically have um, this, this uh, rating pool or you have this pool of players that you only learn about their strengths relative to each other. And meanwhile, like in another place, like say in, I don't know, say St. Louis, you have a whole bunch of players that are competing against each other. And they're not really playing uh, very much, if at all, against the New York players. So what ends up happening is that if um, if systematically the players in New York are improving at a different rate than the players in St. Louis, you know, like maybe more recently, St. Louis is, you know, St. Louis has many more resources these days in chess than uh, the New York does. And so, you know, for example, maybe kind of on average, um, you know, players are getting more instruction and just improving faster in St. Louis than they are in New York. What's going to happen is that the players in St. Louis are getting better on average than the players in New York, but there's nothing in the ratings that can actually detect that because all you're really learning is about how players do against each other in that same environment. So like if everyone is kind of like, you know, again, on average, if, if people are learning you know, kind of from the same source and getting better in the same ways in St. Louis. And so everybody's kind of improving. You're still going to get the same kinds of head-to-head results among the players in St. Louis. And then meanwhile, in New York, the same thing. You're, you're still going to get the same kind of head-to-head um, results. So the ratings themselves aren't really going to be changing very much over time. Like they're going to still kind of stay around the same level. But meanwhile, the St. Louis players are actually better than the New York players. So once you then do start having them compete against each other, like say in national tournaments like U.S. Open or World Open, then you're going to start seeing that the St. Louis players who, you know, like if you pair a St. Louis player and a New York player of the same rating, the St. Louis players are going to do better. Uh, They're going to have better results against the New York players, even though the ratings are about the same. So that's how that can happen. That basically the, the evolution of chess ability in different locales may actually be different, but there's nothing in the rating system that can actually detect that because rating the ratings end up changing only based on relative abilities, like just the head-to-head, res- head-to-head results, not based on any kind of like absolute level of ability that you can measure against. Uh, but you definitely find even on a nation-to-nation basis, you get these lighthouses. Um, I can give you a good example of these, and I can even tell you what the link is that we've discovered so if you were to go to somewhere like greece or turkey or india or poland actually those are the big four you find that because they feed a rate a lot of their chess and because that predominantly the people who play chess there are very young they've got a very youthful chess population they play a lot of rapid and blip uh, sorry, a lot of standard or in fact, Rapid and Blitz junior tournaments against other juniors. And that's had the impact where at the lower end of the FIDE rating list, their rating system has stretched a bit. So if you were playing a 12-year-old from Greece and that 12-year-old was playing against a 12-year-old from somewhere like the Czech Republic and they were both rated 1,300, and they were to play a match of, let's say, 20 games, you would expect the Greek would win, probably by sort of two-thirds to one-third almost, because we know that the ratings stretch in the countries where there is a young chess playing population and where the chess population is a bit older in Western Europe. We find the opposite. Okay, if the ratings are stretched, then what we would observe as a result of that is that the gaps between players are larger than what we would expect to see for players of their rating. 
So we would expect a certain set of results between players when there is a difference of, for example, 200 points. We would expect the higher rated player to win three quarters of the time. That's because the ratings are all derived from a table of expected results. So if what we actually find is that players have a bigger gap than 200 points and are achieving the same sort of three quarters to one quarter result, then that would be a case of stretching and shrinking would be the opposite phenomenon. I have always had this dream to, um, I remember when I was a kid to, to become a grandmaster and the thing, but when I got my first grandmaster, uh, Norm was in a very hard tournament in Mexico and I could beat uh, players like Boris Gelfan uh, in a match of two games, um, Nisi, Livio Dieter, Nisi Piano, like 26 plus, Gelfan was 27 plus at that time. And what that meant for me was that um, I knew that I'm going to get my Grandmaster title. So after I got my first norm, I was really focused on reaching 26 rating and be a 26 plus player. So when I got my last um, Grandmaster norm, that was two years after that tournament. Yeah, it meant, um, um, I mean, it meant a lot to me. So I... I lost actually in that tournament. I lost my first two games, but then I won. I I won seven um, games in in a row, and and I could um, I could get the norm thanks thanks to that I beat. Um, so I I beat a very strong opponent, uh, Omar Almeida from my country. Um, was at that time I think he was uh, already a grandmaster, and it meant uh, a lot for me. But- yeah, I feel like the main innovation that is likely to come up uh, at some point soon is uh, taking advantage of um, computer programs that are, you know, strong uh, chess playing programs to be able to evaluate um, individual players' moves uh, and using that information to estimate strength. Because if you think about it, you know, what's basically going on when in all these rating systems that we currently have um players uh you know the the results that they contribute to a rating is basically whether they win lose or draw an individual game and that's very coarse information it's you know there's not a lot of information that you're really supplying as a result of a single game but if you think about it the amount of information that you're supplying on a move by move basis is enormous i mean if you're playing a you know a 50 50 move game you're basically giving like 50 different pieces of information. I mean, forgetting maybe, maybe less than that, forgetting about like, you know, opening book, but you know, for a good chunk of the game, you know, you're, you're giving very strong evidence about what your strength is really like. And that's something that, um, you know, is, is going to, I I think going to, um, you know, really blow things open in terms of measuring uh, chest strength. So my guess is that like the big, um, I think the big innovation that's likely to come in the next five, 10 years is, is making a more serious attempt at um, estimating ability based on, um, on indi- by, from individual moves. And it's not a trivial problem, but, um, but I think something that, uh, that can be, um, I think a lot of progress can be made on that in the next couple of years. And uh, then his system, which is called the ELO system, wound up being adopted by FIDE, the World Chess Federation, and is used in all, all countries. And I understand some versions of the ELO system have been taken into other sports now. So the U.S. can take credit for really being the leader in developing numerical systems for rating players. Now in Great Britain, they had a, a different system that's similar, but not quite as rigid as the ELO system and use different uh, numerical bases. And you still see that sometimes. But for the most part, ELO ratings are worldwide now. Another thing that's important for school districts to know is the University of Texas at Dallas, along with several other universities in the U.S., offer full-ride scholarships to chess players. That's full-ride, tuition, fees, books, and housing for four years. So... Like at UT Dallas, we don't have a football team, but we have a chess team. So when you're 
looking for activities, obviously the best thing you can do as a K through 12 student is get good grades and score well on standardized tests. I mean, we don't want anyone to skip those things, but there are an increasing number of universities that are going to look at your chess achievement and consider that when they're admitting you or when they're handing out scholarships. And I think that's important for school districts to know. Opposite, opposite example is Tarjan, Grandmaster James Tarjan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this American Grandmaster with unbelievable career. Um, he was pretty good in his time in 1970s, I think, 1980s, and then he quit. Quit playing at all, he became, he, he, he was not, did not become, he, he was a librarian all his life. And he, I think he's from California, I'm not sure exactly, maybe California, somewhere from, from, from the West, California or Oregon. And he spent another maybe 30 years in his library, successfully working, and then he retired. And after he retired, he started to play chess again. And he en entered somewhere in the f one of the famous open tournaments. I'm not sure it was M Isle of Maine or something like this, something like top level things. And he is grandmaster. He was a very good one. He was definitely top 100 at his time. Now, th 30 years of break, he's returning back. He has a gray beard sitting there, just didn't play. And like in the first or second round, he's hitting Kramnik, that was like 10 years ago, even less than 10 years ago. He's hitting Kramnik, he has beaten him. He's beaten Kramnik, who was top five in the world at that time still. It was like, oh my God, Tarjan has come, <laughs> he, he came back. <laughs> yeah, that was a very, very funny moment.